you can't even hear the crowd, but you can hear that bull bellowing like everything else around you is quiet, like he's standing right beside you just bellowing in your ear. Welcome to Beyond the Shoots, where we discuss bull riding and rodeo. More specifically, we discuss the people involved and the places they take us. Marcus Mast is from Middlebury, Indiana, a small town in the northwest part of Indiana in Elkhart County. It is farm country, gravel roads, fields of corn, beans, and hay, pastures with horses, sheep, cows, and calves. Some of these farms are farmed with horses. No tractors with air conditioning, Bluetooth stereos, or GPS. Farmed with horses, teams of horses, to farm the land means to walk the land behind these teams. Marcus Mass grew up Amish. He was taught the four principal values of the Amish culture, faith, family, community, and a modest life. In our conversation, Marcus talks about leaving the Amish lifestyle and culture at the age of 16. It was around this time that he discovered bull riding and was determined to follow this dream. Marcus is on the PBR Unleash the Beast tour and had just finished up the PBR finals in Fort Worth when we caught up with him. Marcus discusses the mental aspects of bull riding, which he believes in completely in a very clear way. He speaks of being in the zone with a specific example that gives me goosebumps each time I hear it. I hope that you enjoy this episode of BTC Beyond the Shoots. It is Friday afternoon and we are talking with Marcus Mast, Middlebury, Indiana cowboy, 28 years of age. Marcus, how are you today? Doing wonderful, just out here enjoying the sunshine. <laughs> and you're in, uh, you're in the. Did you say how, Indiana today? Cur- currently live in How, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. It's just down the road from Middlebury. Okay. I call Middlebury my hometown, and then, I mean, that's basically where I was most of my life. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, you and I met in a a small bull riding in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, and then later in West Virginia. And what struck me then is you came up to the announcer stand, you introduced yourself, and I thought, what a nice young man. So when I watch you on the PBR tour, um, I cheer for you and am excited for you for where you are in your career with this. So you've come a very, very long way. I think that was about six years ago, if I'm not mistaken, I saw you in those bull ridings. And by the way, you won both those bull ridings. Go back and check your records. You probably have the <laughs> check somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, uh, I appreciate that, but yeah, I'll have to go back and look. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm on the PBR website, and my goodness, the number of events that you attend, my friend, uh, started, looks like, in 2013, and got pretty serious about it in, like, 2018 and 2019. Would that be about right? Yeah, I think 2018, I, I thought I was getting serious about it, and I really wasn't as serious as I thought about, thought I was, and then 19, I got a lot more serious about it. We approached it at a different angle, and we got a lot of places we wanted to be at in 19. Okay, in 19. So when you say you approach it from a different angle, what does that mean, Marcus? I guess I I just always thought I had something to prove, and, you know, we, we all have something to prove, but, I mean, obviously, once you can compete at that level at the top and um, you – yeah, you still have something to prove, but you just take care of your job, ride your bulls and whatnot, and the proving, proving yourself is going to take care of itself. Exactly. Okay, very good. So a bit of a different background than some of the other bull riders we may come across. Talk about growing up. Elkhart County, I believe you were dairy farming. Talk a little bit yeah. about um, about growing up. Yeah, I grew up on a small Amish dairy farm. I mean, we... Actually, when I was a little kid, we only milked one cow at the time. We hand milked her by hand. And then I think it was probably about the time I was six or seven, maybe, we 
we uh, dad bought a bunch of Holsteins and we started a little dairy farm, about 30 head, normally about 25 to 35 head, anywhere in that range. Um, had about 60 acres and we rented another 60 acres behind us to do a little farming and whatnot for silage and hay and all that stuff. But yeah, just a little ex Amish kid, I guess. Okay. And mostly farmed with horses then, Marcus? Oh yeah. Yep. We did all our farm work with a team of horses, whether it was two horses at a time or up to eight horses at a time, you know, that we'd, we'd hitch together, you know, if we'd have a big two, but if we'd have what we called a big plow, which was a two bottom plow, um, if it was a field that hadn't been plowed in a couple of years, you know, if it was hard packed down, plowed hard, we'd, uh, use eight horses and, uh, use four in the front and four in the back. And yeah, all our baling, all our mowing hay, all our crops and everything got done with horses. Okay. Okay. And, and how old were you when you started driving teams and really working? Oh, shoot. I was, I don't know. I was probably six when I first started. I mean, we had, I mean, back, back then we had a team that my grandpa used to own back when he was still farming. So, I mean, they were probably 10 years older than I was and they knew more about it than I did. So yeah. as long as I could hold the, hold the reins, they, I mean, they took care of most everything else. I, most of the time you wouldn't even have to drive them and they'd still know where they're going. Yeah. And, and you grew corn. Did you pick that by hand? Uh, we'd like our, our, uh, corn that we'd like put in the corn crib and whatnot. We'd husk that by hand Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until I was, I think when I was, 14 or 15 dad put, bought a corn picker so we didn't have to do that by hand anymore which i think we most of the times we'd still go around the outside and do the first two or three rows until we could get through with i think we'd normally hitch three three horses for that mm-hmm. for the corn picker so we'd go because dad would plant them all the way out would plant the corn fields all the way out to the fence so We'd have to go around with <clears throat> with the gravity wagon and just, or even just the regular wagon with little sides on it. And we'd uh, hust the first two or three rows by hand. That way we don't waste any of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so how are you milking 30 head of cows? Not by hand anymore. No, we, uh, we redid our barn when I was... Oh, I don't know if I was six when we redid our barn Mm -hmm. and we got, got a bigger, bigger setup, had a diesel room and whatnot. And then, uh, just your normal, uh, milkers Mm -hmm. had the buckets and whatnot. I mean, we didn't have the parlor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had all our vacuum milkers and diesel and whatnot. Okay. And then, um, at 16, you leave the family farm. Yeah, at 16, I actually, I, I went and uh, I got a job of my own. Went and uh, started doing some factory work, which they're at the factory. I mean, you can't, you can't use no power tools until you're 18, mm-hmm. but you can do what they call hand receiving and whatnot. It's just an hourly wage you make. I think they paid 12 to 15 bucks an hour. Maybe maybe it was only eight bucks an hour. I can't remember for sure. Mm-hmm. And you just basically walk around and put boxes of stuff away, parts and whatnot. And went and got a job to do that. And it was just before I turned seventeen. I I was going with some buddies to bull ride and a couple couple weekends in a row. And finally decided, you know what, I'd I'd like to drive my hand to bull ride. Once I did that, Dad was too fond of that, and mm-hmm. I got a vehicle, and I ended up, he wasn't too fond of me living at the house anymore, so I ended up moving out, mm-hmm. kind of went my own way after that. So you, so that's 12 years ago, you struck out on your own, more or less, and yeah. and you had bull riding in your sights at that point, saying, this is what I want to do? 
So, I mean, a lot of times, like a lot of these Amish kids, when they when they leave the Amish at 16, they'll go out and party, and I mean that that's all their life consists of over the weekend. So, go out and drink all the see see who can drink the most beer, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I was at that time I. I did a lot of that too, and I mean it was something that I did just because everybody else did. I mean I never really got that big of a kick out of it, mm-hmm. and I was playing a bunch of other sports too, just amateur places. Um, we got a there's a park not too far from there where I grew up where they got a couple big baseball diamonds, they got football, uh, volleyball, and basketball and whatever. I mean it's it's a place where a lot of these kids they'll go to during the week and they'll play sports. Okay. Um, so I was actually at the time when I first got on my first bull, I was just getting ready to start a season of football and I was playing softball and I was playing basketball at the time. So I had things scheduled Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And then if I wanted to go to, if I wanted to go get on bull Saturday and Sunday and Wednesday, I could do that. Um, so I was playing all these other sports and still trying to go party with all my buddies. Cause that's what all my buddies did. And I didn't have enough money to do all that stuff. So finally I decided, well, it's either partying or it's riding bulls. So I, I like riding bulls a little bit, a little bit, a lot better than what I did partying. So <laughs> okay. we, uh, we kind of quit going to parties and I mean, I'd, I'd still go to them every now and then if I had the money for it. If I was, if I'd win me a good little paycheck, I'd, uh, I'd go to a party maybe after I get back. Um, but for the most part, we just stuck to getting on bulls and trying to get better at that. I'll be darned. And where were you getting on bulls? It sounded like you didn't have to travel very far. Um, so that back then we actually had two practice pens that were like an hour and a half from my house there was one that bucked every wednesday night and then one that bucked monday nights and sometimes they'd have an event sundays where i mean it, it was like a 50 dollar entry fee no added money and it was basically bucking the exact same bulls that would get on for practice okay and any any formal training or any formal bull riding instruction any rodeo schools anything like that did you do that or just uh, the, the guy so the guy that helped me get started he had a drop barrel at the time and i'd i'd go over there every night i'd get a chance i'd go over there and i'd get on the drop barrel and you know try and for the little that we knew we'd try and perfect it and try and help us out and whatnot but we ended up um, I think it was later on that fall, there was Gary Lafayette put on a school about four hours north of the house. And I was going to go to the school and I ended up, uh, went to a bull ride and I was, I wasn't getting nothing rode for a while there before I was going to the school and which that was, you know, obviously made me even want to go to school even more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to a bull ride and. I think the night before we went to school and I was hoping I could win money so I could pay for the school mm-hmm. and I ended up getting bucked off and didn't make any money and I was broke. I mean, I had maybe $10 to my name, but I figured, shoot, it, it ain't going to hurt me to just at least go with, with my buddies and hang out, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, Gary doesn't have to work one-on-one with me or whatever, mm-hmm. but I can at least go hang out and it'll still help me out some. And by the time those three days were over and I got out of that board in school, I felt like I, I was a whole different guy. I felt like I knew the whole world more than what I knew before. And I ended up going, and I think the next probably five board islands I went to, I ended up placing at them. And so, so I ended up by, so what changed? I don't know what, what what it sounds like you you walked away with some new knowledge, some new confidence, some new skill. What changed, Marcus? What that uh, sounds like a switch got flipped. I don't know. I guess I, I mean I. The main thing I've always got out of 
out of Gary Lafayette is his positive thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I might not have learned a whole lot up at that school and I, I ended up the like the third day he come up to me and he's like, why are you not getting on any bulls? I said, well, I, I didn't have any money to pay for the school. And I said, I didn't want to bother you, you know, with mm -hmm. a cheapskate and all that stuff. And he's like, well, you need to get on some bulls. I want to see what, what you can do. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, I, I got on, I think I got on five bulls back to back to back. Everybody else was done. And I decided, you know what, screw it. I'm going to get on some bulls. And they loaded them left and right for me. So I got on them. And he's like, man, I like what I'm seeing out of you. And he's like, after we were done getting on bulls, he's like, why don't you jump on the drop barrel? Like, I can help you out quite a bit. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, that's good. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know that I even learned that much, but it was more so, you know, you had a guy like Gary Lafayette telling this guy that's been riding bulls for maybe half a year at that point, okay. telling him how great he can be mm -hmm. and what all he's going to be able to do if he keeps doing what he's doing. And, you know, it, it was more so the positive yeah. mindset of it, I guess, and just being able to walk out of there and like, shit, I can do this shit. This ain't, this ain't as hard as everybody makes it look like. Okay. So someone believing in you, someone having confidence in you helped you. Yeah. And you know, I mean, did he actually really see that in me? I have no idea, mm -hmm. but he sure made me believe that he's seen it out of me. So why not go do it? Well, you know, and, and you bring up something really, really interesting. We talk a lot about bull riding's uh, high percentage mental game. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, I think most people say bull riding's 90% mental. Yeah. But I always tell everybody, yeah, everybody says 90% mental, but I say it's 99.9% .9 mental. Really? That much? That I mean, much? I okay. mean, you just... I mean, once once you get your mind to believe it, I mean, you can, you truly get your mind to believe something. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's impossible. I mean, it's it's crazy to think, you know. I mean, just like earlier this year, I had drawn a bull in the long round that had been being in the short rounds every time, and uh, you know, I mean, this is at a UTB event, you know. Mm -hmm. Probably everybody probably thinks, oh, well, you're at the UTB. You, you should be able to believe that every time that you'll be able to ride this bull. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I've always, I don't like saying I've always struggled, but I've always had bigger, I could ride bulls into my hand better than I could away mm -hmm. from my hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's all a mind thing too, because I just proved it the other day. I rode one up for practice. I went to J-Dub's house and he loaded one for me and I rode one away from my hand for 16 seconds because he kept on telling me to stay on, keep going. Right, right. Um, but I drew a bull that had been, they had been putting him in the short rounds and I drew him in the first round and he was always right there around the right. Yeah. And, you know, I kept telling myself, you know, the, the best way to win a long round at one of these deals is to draw a short round bull in the long round and just ride that bull. Right. But... <laughs> Up until the point where I got on him, I never felt like my mind actually believed it. Really? Okay. And all of a sudden, I don't know what it was, all of a sudden something clicked, and I ended up rode the bull like a day off. I mean, it, it, it's weird how it works, but once you can actually get your mind to actually believe it, mm -hmm. and you kind of click into a zone, and your your I guess your muscle memory kind of takes over, and takes care of all the work for you so what is that zone marcus is that i mean are, is it is your mind just clear it's blank and having faith in that muscle memory describe what that is when you when you climb over and begin your process your procedure on the bull to get ready to go out what what where is your mind how do you get into that zone and that that's something that is really hard to explain but i feel like there's times when you know, we crawl in there and you hear everything the announcer says, you hear everything the guys on the back of the chute say. And I feel like at that time, your mind is not in that zone because you're aware of all your surroundings. Like when you're on the, in that zone, 
you're not aware of anything that's happening around you. You're aware of what you're doing and what the bull is doing under you. And when you're in, when you're in that zone, you, you don't even hear the announcer. You don't hear the crowd. You don't hear the guys on the back of the shoots. All you hear is what you're doing and what the bull is doing. There's times when you can hear, I mean, you're focused on what, what the bull is doing, what you're doing, and you're focusing on when the whistle's blowing. Mm -hmm. And there's times, you know, when the bull's bellowing while he's bucking, Mm -hmm. you can't even hear the crowd, but you can hear that bull bellowing like everything else around you is quiet, like he's standing right beside you just bellowing in your ear. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, like, there's times when I make a great bull ride and I jump off and, you know, I go back the next day and I think, okay, now I'm going to do everything the same way. I'm, I'm not going to think about anything else in the shoots. I'm not going to notice what the announcer is going to say. I'm not going to notice what the guy on the back of the shoots are going to say, because I can't remember what happened yesterday when I was in the shoot. I mean, I don't. I I can try and think of what the announcer said, but I cannot for the for the same life I cannot remember what the announcer said, what the guys on the back of shoots were saying to me, or any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, you go in there and you think, well, I'm going to do the, everything the same way. Well, if your life would depend on it, you're thinking about everything because you're trying so hard to mentally focus on that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, uh, it's, it's a hard zone to get into, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but once you get into it, it's, there ain't a whole lot that's going to stop you. Yeah. So is there anything you work on during the week that, that, uh, builds that mental muscle, that, that ability to set everything else aside and have this, it sounds like what you're describing is a super intense focus on what you're doing and everything else gets quiet around it. Am I describing that right? Yeah. I mean, I guess that would be a way better description of it than what I described it as. In. Um, but I feel like the stuff you during the week do during the week at home when you come home and you, you do your workouts and whatnot to prepare for this is pushing yourself past the limits. Like you, mm-hmm. when you think you can't go no more, when you think you you can't lift another weight or you can't run another step or you can't do another, another drill on the drop barrel or any of that. You keep pushing yourself past it. Mm -hmm. It pushes you into that zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And it gives you more, I don't know. It always, for me, it's always given me more confidence when I'm at the event to put, be able to get into that zone. Okay. Okay. So there are things that you can do that builds that mental focus during the week, whether it's exercise, conditioning, or whatever is what I'm hearing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. I mean, there there's always new stuff you can do and always new limits you can push yourself to. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously riding bulls ain't <laughs> It ain't it ain't for the weak hearted and everybody says it's impossible or it should be impossible, you know, so you gotta push yourself past the limit in order to be able to ride a bull. So so let me go back then a bit, and I agree with everything you're saying. Let me go back a bit. Uh growing up Amish. What 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 skills, what mindset, what standards? When I think of Amish, I think of a, a pretty orderly orderly way of life. Um is there anything that you brought forth from from growing up Amish that has assisted you in that mental aspect of of, uh, of writing? I don't know. I guess I always, when I was born, when I was raised still in the Amish community, you know, we had to do everything by our hand, with our hands and whatnot and, uh, for the most part. So there was never a job that was too big that you couldn't handle. If you couldn't handle it, you were a you were a weak hearted, mm-hmm. weak hearted little shithead. And, mm-hmm. um, I guess always for me, always growing up as a kid it was work was my motivation. I mean, okay. you, you tell me, you tell me I'm not strong enough to do it or you, I don't have enough heart to do it. And I, 
You can bet every one of your last pennies that I'm going to try and prove you wrong. Okay, okay. So you bring that worth work ethic to your bull riding. That's that that's uh, yeah. That's what I try to do. Okay, okay. And and I, I agree with you. Ninety nine point nine percent mental aspect. Absolutely. So then, how do you stay strong? How do you stay centered when? You know, the best bull riders are riding 40% of the bulls they get on, which means you're going to ride four out of 10 bulls, which means you're going to get bucked off of six out of 10 bulls. How do you stay strong and and have it right and ready when you get on the next bull? Uh, you just got to, you, you got to let yesterday go. I mean, what happened yesterday, you you can't change that. Yeah. You, you can't make a difference what happened yesterday, but you can make a difference on how hard you try tomorrow Yeah. or how, tr- how hard you try today. And, um, uh, I guess I actually seen down at the world finals just a couple of weeks ago. I walked down to the gym a couple of times. Every time I'd walk out of the gym, I'd see this saying Pope painted on the wall. And said, if you want to be better than you were yesterday, mm-hmm. you got to work. If you want to be better tomorrow than what you were yesterday, mm-hmm. you got to push yourself harder today. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and speaking of the world finals, your round five ride on train station, dude, was remarkable. It was so neat to watch. You had you rode with such confidence, and this is a bull that bucks off about seventy five percent of the bull riders that get on him. You rode with such confidence. You opened up. You spurred. He did. He did um, circle to into your hand. Eighty eight point five points. Tell us about that ride and the confidence that gave you, and and um, how how it helps. Well, I appreciate that. Um, that was you know we had we had three. I think we had three draft rounds, which we got to pick our bulls the night before, mm-hmm. after the, the night before round was over. So round that was in round five. Round four, after the round was over, we got to pick our bulls. And I didn't do very well in round four. I didn't. I was left on close to the bottom. I didn't think I was going to have a good bull left. And um, I had done my research on kind of the bulls I was looking at and that bull, I really didn't know much about him, and uh, that was, I think that was the last one I really wanted to pick. Other than that, it was nothing that really a whole lot of guys don't really want to get on, and there's some guys that didn't talk too, too good about that bull, but one of the guys said something about that Tate had got on him in an earlier round. It was really good right there in the door around the left, and mm-hmm. I said, shoot, I might as well take that one and be better than the other one that I was kind of thinking that I might get left with. And uh, and I guess the biggest thing for me was when I showed up to the board on that day, uh, J-Dub actually had my team chaps with him. And I was, I was riding with my old chaps because I had torn my other one. Mm-hmm. And he sent me a picture earlier that day of them in his back seat. And he said, well, we might change the world finals around today. And I said, shoot, I'll take anything at this point. Cause my world finals hadn't been going good at all yet. Yeah. And, uh, so he showed up and he seen me and he's like, Hey, let's go get your chaps. So I walked out back with him out to his truck and, you know, I mean, he didn't have to say anything to me, but, you know, he's my coach during team season, so he just, he kind of looked at me, and I had gotten on a bull at his house earlier that week before round four, in between round three and round four. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so he, as we were walking out, he kind of looks at me, and he says, hey, that bull you got on last night, he said, don't let that one get to you. He said, nobody rides that bull, and he said, that bull was around the ride away from your hand, and he said, the way that bull bucked, he wants you off to the outside. And he said, that's the way you came off. But he said, it wasn't like you were stretched out and not knowing what move to make like you were in the earlier rounds. He said, all you had to do was be able to shift your hips a little bit to the right and you would have been all right. But he said, your hand popped out and 
there wasn't much he could do about it. So he said, don't let that one get, get to you. And said, just go take care of business today and uh, take him jump for jump and ride the shit out of him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, hearing that from my coach, it, I mean, it kind of clicked in me and I kind of felt already like I had a good bull for, for that round five. And um, I guess it ended up all working out. The bull felt good underneath me and figured I'd get a couple of more couple money shot money chops in and I guess the judges liked it they did it was great watching just absolutely great watching we were cheering for you 88 and a half points on the bull no very impressive and and you're you're reinforcing that 99.9 percent mental aspect having somebody what I, I i'm hearing this again gary lepew did it jw hart did it someone who believed in you somebody who said not a big thing. Here's all you needed to do then. Put that into your toolbox. Maybe next time you're on a bull. However, go get this one tonight. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah, from that, I mean, that was one of the big things with the teams, too. You know, everybody's like, oh, you rode so much better during teams than you did in the individual season. And in my individual season this year, out since the teams now, I rode better than I ever had before in the individual season. But yeah. The team season, I mean, that everybody says, well, why did you ride so much better then than you do now or than you did before? And I give all the credit to J-Dub, you know. I mean, I always had him there by my side. And, I mean, he wanted me to get on bulls that I had no faith in myself that I could ride at that at that point. And I told him, I said, well, you think I can ride him? Throw me on him. Mm-hmm. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll try, try and see if I can get him road and he's well he ended up by the second half of the season he called me and he's like i bet you can't ride this one yeah i tell him well i'm i'm gonna try my hardest to prove you wrong yeah no we we talked about you last year during the teams um i i could see that this was fitting you that the team environment access to a coach uh getting put on the right kind of bulls being challenged in the right way I mean, your riding percentage went up. I'm looking at the stats. You you had some nice placings. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You you joined them as a free agent. You joined the Kansas City Outlaws as a free agent in 2022. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I uh, signed off right after the was the 12 o'clock 1201 mark after the draft. J Dub called me, in which I had been talking with J Dub, and he called me and said sign this practice roster uh, agreement for me and he said we're going to keep on working at it um, and then just just before shot actually I think it was just before Big Sky Big Sky was three days it, there was one day off just before Cheyenne between Big Sky and Cheyenne and then Big Sky was the three days before that mm-hmm. just before I went into Big Sky I signed signed the uh protected roster agreement and we kept on working at it from there absolutely and and as i said what a just just a joy to watch last year you know the leadership was coming the the you were leader of the team i mean that was very apparent from where we were sitting watching it on tv marcus well you know that that's what everybody says but then again, I mean, you know, I got to go back to give J Dub the credit for it because it, I mean, without him believing in it, in me and doing it, and him uh, keeping on coaching me, you know, I mean, obviously it's his, it was his job at that point, but I mean, he could have easily sat me on the side if he wanted to, mm-hmm. um, and given somebody else a shot at it too, and you know, he kept on believing in me and. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people called me the captain of the team, but there wasn't no difference from me. In my opinion, there wasn't any different from the day I signed that, uh, practice squad agreement till the day the season was over. I was the same guy. I tried to approach the bulls the same way, tried to approach every guy at the same, the same way and just look at everything the same. Yeah. We we've always considered bull riding a team or an individual sport. 
right? Um, and it's similar in, in some ways to like wrestling. You still got to win your match. One yeah. guy off the wrestling team may go to the state championships, but it's still a team sport. How is the, right. the team aspect? How has the team aspect helped you or hurt you? You know, I mean, obviously, according to stats, it's definitely helped me. And I, I feel like it's helped me even now during the individual season. It, I feel like it's made me a better a better uh, bull rider and a better human and just in general. But it's uh, it's an awesome deal, you know, with the teams. And there's a lot of people say, well, this ain't right. This is still jacked up it's bull riding ain't no team sport how how can you guys go to teams now well yeah i mean you can look at it that way you can look at it as it ain't no team sport but um uh, who says baseball is a team sport yeah i mean you gotta have teammates but when you step up to that plate your teammates can't hit the ball for you right right good so point. good point. Um, yeah but it's the atmosphere was way different. I felt like the atmosphere was way different. And just, um, I don't know, I guess for better words was everybody was more unselfish. Oh, really? You know, okay. I mean, okay. you know, your individual season, you know, yeah, you want your buddies to do good, but you want to do just a little bit better than they do. Right. Right. Well, the team season, you know, you're on a team. So, I mean, you got your teammates. Yeah, you got some of your buddies that are on the other teams too, but you got your teammates that you're now close with. You've been working together as a team for how long now? And, you know, you, you're going to go out and you want to be 90. You might be the first guy out on your team you're 90. Well, individual season, you're going to be back on the back of shoots. You're going to be cheering for your buddies, but – you still deep down as human beings, we still want him to be eight and nine and a half and not 91 right. or 90 and a half. You right, know? right. 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 And now this team season, the cool thing about it is, you know, you can go back on the shoots and deep down, you want your, your teammate to go out and be 92 mm-hmm. when you're only 90. Right. Oh. Just because, I mean, it, it's doing good for him, but it also is doing good for you. I mean, it's helping you out too, you know I mean? That's, that's the bullshit part about human nature, you know? I mean, yeah, we can say, well, we're happy for you or we're, but I don't think deep down, I don't think anybody can say, well, yeah, I'm glad you beat me. Yeah. And, and you are seeing that though, in the team environment, you are cheering and, and truly wishing somebody does well. Yeah, I mean, I I think it goes for every team, you know. I mean, everybody's, and you can see it on the back of the shoots, you know. Everybody's a lot. And I, in my opinion, I feel like everybody's a lot more fired up for their friends that or their teammates to do good than they are during the individual season. Mm-hmm. And and you made a comment, made you a better bull rider, but also made you a better human being. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, I don't know. I guess it just, it, it made me see a lot more into having faith in somebody, you know, I mean, there's, there's only one way I could be on, on a team. And that was if one coach had faith in me and the, what I could do, you know, I mean, I don't live down in Texas. I don't live out West or Oklahoma or wherever, you know, where, you know, how many bull riders come from Indiana? Right. Right. And, uh, I've always kind of struggled on tour and, but I was just hoping one, one coach would have faith in me. So it's something that I feel like now I do better in extending that out, you know, having, having faith in somebody else and just believing, trying to help them believe with a little bit of help they could, do so much better or whatever. I mean, not necessarily that they're doing bad, but just helping them out, I guess. That is, that is beautiful. And we need more of that in this world, Marcus. We need more of that. Um, so training camp, when does that kick off? 
Uh, we were actually going to have it this coming week. Uh, I was supposed to fly out there, or no, it was next week. Was uh, yeah, I was supposed to fly out there next Monday, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. But now we we ended up pushing it off a week, so I think it's the twentieth and twenty first now, I believe. And and teams doesn't kick off until Cheyenne, so the end of July, so two complete months open. What are you doing between here and there? Uh, mostly just trying to catch up stuff around the house. I have, I mean, we had obviously that last run before World Finals. We we had a couple three day events, and we had some events during the week. So you know, I mean, we were we didn't have a whole lot of time at home and. I was getting way behind on stuff at home and um uh, but I'm pretty well caught up on all that stuff now so I got uh I was going to take uh about a month and a half off anyway and just take it easy and try and heal up and get ready for the team season you know so I'm not all banged up for okay. teams um so I'm actually tomorrow I'm judging a fraternity and then Bull riding, a, bull riding for charity. Uh, no, it'll be just dummy calves. Dummy calves. Oh, okay, okay. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and then I think it's in two weeks. I got another one. Uh, that I gotta you know, do Friday night and Saturdays. Um, and then we're taking taking the kids, and then my brother were. And his family were going up to Michigan Adventures there a couple weeks too, oh, and just fun. just hang out and chill and relax for a day. And uh, my wife's birthday's coming up here the end of this month, so I gotta we gotta go take a day off for her birthday. And for sure. Uh, then we got Shipshawana, Indiana PBRs, which is right. I mean, that's eight eight miles from my house i think i can pretty well run to it if i want to so and and, uh, and you won that last year yeah i won that one last year you know i mean it's like i said it's eight miles from the house yeah. so i can't i can't sit at home for that one yeah obviously so that was going to be my first event back after finals okay um but i think i'm actually j-dub wants us us outlaws kind of as a team to go down to Rock Springs, Texas, which would be the weekend before the Mac Center event. So we'll I'll probably go to that first and then go to Shipshawana. Okay. And uh, then I'll have another, I think it'll be like a week and a half or maybe even two and a half weeks off before Big Sky. Uh, Big Sky is Thursday, Friday, Saturday at the end of the month and then we got monday off or sunday off and then shine is monday and tuesday okay okay so we'll be hard back at it after that one and and how's your how's your arm your right arm i believe your your free arm uh when we saw you in indianapolis you had uh you had a cast or you had a brace on it yeah it's it's good now it's i don't wear the cast anymore i mean it's healed up now for the most part it's still got a weird looking bump in it but it feels a lot better than it did at that point good good and you're feeling pretty healthy a little bumped up banged up as you said but you're resting you're recovering are you feeling better i'm actually feeling a lot better than i thought i was that's why i was going to take a couple weeks off because i was kind of banged up going coming up to well louisville i was pretty banged up going into louisville and had had a broken rib or two and then I had my broken hand, and um, I was going to take a couple weeks off after finals to try and heal all that up because I figured with finals it'll I'll get all banged up again. But luckily, I mean, I guess luckily for the most part, I didn't ride good enough or long enough to get beat up at the finals except for the one. Uh, and I I feel good now. I mean, I feel great. I'd, I'd like to be going to bull ridings, but yeah. I promised people I'd – I'd do stuff for them because I was going to take time off. So yeah, well, we were we were in we were in Louisville and we cheered you on there. We were able to well, go to that, that event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so in this last few minutes, you know, you come uh, 
grew up Amish. Um, any messages you want to give to, you're kind of a trailblazer, you know, in leaving the culture. And any message for any any young Amish folks that are out there? Yeah, I mean, I guess the main part is just because we ain't born and raised to do it, even though our background's different and we're, I mean, according to them, we're in the wrong because we left the Amish. But, I mean, I, I don't feel like that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like the biggest thing is just keep Keep following the path God's leading you on, and just if God's leading you on it, why not believe in it? Because if you can believe in it and God's leading you on it, there's no reason you can't excel in it. What a great conversation. Marcus spoke of the power of belief, of believing in oneself, and more specifically, in someone believing in him. Having faith in him. Marcus shared with us two specific times that he experienced this. First, by Gary LeFew, who was described as the rodeo guru of positive thinking. Gary was inducted into the 2002 Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs. Gary learned and applied the concepts of positive thinking and visualization to win the PRCA Bull Riding Championship in 1970. He was a pioneer of understanding the power of the mind and how it can be applied to bull riding. He teaches these concepts today, visualization and strength of mind. Marcus was at one of Mr. LeFew's bull riding schools and got to experience his teachings and was given the confidence that he could ride. Second, by J.W. Hart, the head coach of the Kansas City Outlaws before he got on his PBR finals round five bull. J.W.'s advice to move past the prior round's buck off while giving him a correction that he may try in the future. Marcus went on to ride his round five bull train station for 88 and a half points. The power of belief. The ability to move past the past. Taking only the lessons of the past to the future. This is a life lesson that Marcus shared with us. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. It was a pleasure to speak with Marcus, and we want to thank him for taking the time to speak with us. Watch for him this team season, riding for the Kansas City Outlaws. Speaking of strength of mind, I'm starting an eight-week resiliency course with the Miracle Activation Center. I will let you know what I discover. To make your listening easier, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Search for Beyond the Shoots and follow us. Until next time, this is Doug Simcox.